Introduction On the 21st of October 2021, I uploaded the first in a series of videos on the opium wars of the mid to late 19th century. In July 2022, I received a critical comment on the video, which was sufficiently detailed and thoughtful to deserve a lengthy response. I started writing a reply, but soon realized it would be best to make an entire video in order to do the subject justice. The comment took issue with a sentence in my first Opium War video in which I referred to the Qing Dynasty army as medieval. This was a single word in a single sentence, and I thought that in context it would be understood as a slight exaggeration for the purpose of highlighting the significant technology gap between the British army and the Qing Dynasty army. However, this commentator took the reference quite literally and objected, writing, quote, Re the Bannerman and Green Standard Army, they were not medieval, end quote. Their entire response was long and detailed, citing evidence for what they considered to be military technology parity between the British and Qing armies, but in this section, I will just give a condensed overview of their argument. I'll address their specific arguments and examples throughout the rest of the video. The commenter argued against the idea that a technology gap was a significant contributing factor to the Qing Dynasty's defeat in the Opium Wars, attributing their loss to other factors, and arguing that the British and Qing armies were fairly evenly matched, with different strengths and weaknesses on either side. They wrote, quote, They implemented a poor strategy and ineffective tactics. In war, each side has both its strengths and weaknesses. These need to be understood and mitigated. End quote. The commenter acknowledged the Qing army was, quote, outmatched on the water, end quote, but argued, quote, had the Qing withdrawn to fight in the interior, picking the terrain that best maximized its advantages, British and French ones would have disappeared, end quote. Further commenting that the British forces, quote, had been weakened by disease such as dysentery upon their arrival in Singapore, end quote. The commenter continued to support their argument that the only significant technological advantage on the British side was naval, with statements such as, quote, it was the British ships that proved their potency. That advantage disappears by moving inland and beyond ship cannon range, end quote. They also attributed the defeat of the Qing army to weaknesses in Qing strategy and disunity within the Qing army, writing, quote, the Qing left it to local militias and garrisons rather than mobilizing troops from elsewhere to bring to the fight, end quote. And citing incidents of the Bannermen, the core of the Qing standing army who belonged to the Manchu, a non-Chinese ethnic group, actually, quote, robbing and massacring Han Chinese in the fortresses because they believed the Han sided with the British, end quote, thus weakening the Qing dynasty's defenses in the war effort. The commenter compared the Opium Wars with the later Anglo-Zulu War, stating, quote, If the Zulus, who were less technologically sophisticated than the Qing, could give the British all kinds of hell, there is no reason why the Qing shouldn't have been able to, end quote. Finally, the commenter cited the Qing dynasty's underestimation of their opponent and lack of standardized training, writing, quote, The Qing held condescending views of the enemy and underestimated them, end quote. And, quote, Troop quality varied as training wasn't standardized across the military, end quote, before adding, quote, that's not a medieval failing, end quote. In conclusion, the commenter wrote, quote, you did a good job with the critical analysis of opium, but didn't do so for military, falling for tropes, end quote. This video responds to the commenter's arguments covering these topics. One. Reality of the British and Qing technology gap. 2. British firearms were superior to Qing firearms. 3. British cannon were superior to Qing cannon. 4. British gunpowder was superior to Qing gunpowder. 5. Qing superstition and magical thinking. Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. Reality of the British and Qing Technology Gap Let's start with the commenter's first objection. Quote, Re the Bannermen and Green Standard Army, they were not medieval, 
end quote. As I mentioned previously, I did use the term medieval as a slight exaggeration for the purpose of highlighting the significant technology gap between the British army and the Qing dynasty army. However, even putting exaggeration aside, there is some merit for its use. In fact, it's not difficult to find historical works using this term to characterize the technological gulf which existed between the British and Qing armies. In his 1996 article, The Peiyang and Nanyang Cruises of the 1880s, military historian Rigid N.J. Wright comments specifically on the Opium Wars, saying, quote, China fought with medieval weapons, end quote. In his 2017 work on the Russian Revolution and its aftermath, Russian journalist Mikhail Zyga wrote of the Opium Wars, quote, The Chinese army, equipped with medieval weapons, cannot compete with the British, end quote. Similarly, in his 2009 work on the history of revolutionary China, in collaboration with writer Alden R. Carter, political science educator David Wenwei Zhang comments, quote, The medieval weapons of the Chinese were no match, end quote. Likewise, in his 2009 book, Soldiers of the Queen, Victorian Colonial Conflict in the Words of Those Who Fought, historian Stephen Manning writes, quote, Although the Chinese fought bravely, they did so with primarily medieval weapons of swords, spears, and bows, and were no match for disciplined British firepower, end quote. Even more decisively, during the 1930s, Chinese historian Jiang Ting Fu commented forcefully on the Qing Dynasty's loss of the Opium Wars, writing, quote, our weaponry and our army were the defences of medieval times. Our government was a medieval government. Our people, including the scholar elite, were people of medieval times. End quote. I believe this collection of quotations is sufficient to justify the use of the term medieval as a description of the Qing Dynasty's military during the Opium Wars. Now let's move to the commenter's broader argument that the technology gap between the British and Qing armies was not the primary cause of the Qing's defeat. The commenter attributes British success to their superior navy, the Qing government's underestimation of the enemy, uneven troop quality within the Qing army, infighting in the Qing army, and the lack of enthusiasm for the war among the emperor and other elites. Consequently, the commenter argues that if the British had engaged the Qing army deep inland, the British advantage, quote, would have vanished, end quote. However, is this true? The commenter didn't cite any sources for the idea that a technological gap between the British and Qing armies was not a contributing factor to the Qing dynasty's defeat, but it's very easy to find scholarly commentary arguing that the technological gap was, in fact, decisive. We will look at general statements first and then move on to more detailed analysis. Chinese historian Hai Jian Mao, who specializes in the Opium Wars, writes explicitly, quote, Muskets, cannon, gunpowder, fortresses, and ships are tangible objects. It is easy to determine their relative strengths, so there has been little debate about the fact that, in this area, the Qing Empire was at a disadvantage in the Opium War, end quote. Similarly, in his 2017 book, The Gunpowder Age, Historian Tonio Andrade writes, quote, By the Opium War, the British had an overwhelming military edge. End quote. Andrade writes, quote, The most systematic study of weaponry used in the war concludes that the Chinese and British were in two different historical eras the British in the fire weapon era and the Chinese in the mixed era, end quote, explaining that the Qing army was mainly equipped with pre gunpowder era weapons with gunpowder weapons being used, quote, in small numbers, end quote. This is supported by Mao, who writes, quote, Qing armies were not fully equipped with muskets. Some soldiers had only swords, spears, and bows, end quote. Mao's assessment of the full armed potential of the Qing dynasty is a little more optimistic. Quote, across the empire, the number of soldiers with guns was equal to the number bearing pre-gunpowder weapons, end quote. However, Andrade says, quote, modern research also shows that Qing infantry forces were also backward, end quote, quoting Chinese scholarship, which estimates that 60 to 70 percent of the army was equipped with traditional weapons such as swords, bows and arrows, and only 30 to 40 percent of weapons were gunpowder weapons. <laughs> 
As an example of the Qing army's technological inferiority, Andrade cites the significant difference in British and Qing firearm technology, noting that in comparison with the British weapons, quote, the Qing matchlock guns were slow, unwieldy, and dangerous, as British observers noted with empathy and derision, end quote. Military historian Xiao Yijong likewise describes the Qing army's dependence on medieval cold arms and outdated firearms, writing, quote, Qing soldiers in combat relied on old-fashioned wall guns and shotguns in addition to knives, spears, bows, and arrows, end quote. He adds that the Qing shotgun fired only one to two shots a minute to an effective range less than 100 meters. Zhong notes some of the Qing army's guns were, quote, long in disrepair and could not be used, end quote, and observes the British guns were, quote, far superior to the shotguns used by the Qing soldiers, end quote. He also adds, quote, the field artillery and coastal artillery of the Qing army were obsolete and broken down, end quote. This agrees with the description of the Qing military given by the other scholars cited here. All of them cite the significant technological gap between the British and Qing armies as a major factor, or even the primary factor, contributing to the Qing dynasty's defeat in the Opium Wars. Andrade does point out, quote, the problem for the Qing wasn't just antiquated weapons, end quote, adding, its forces also suffered from ineffective drill, end quote. He explains that the Qing army's musketeers, quote, drilled only five times a month, end quote, and cites an American visitor ridiculing their clumsy military exercises. Andrade comments, quote, by the eve of the Opium War, drilling standards had fallen well below those of the early Qing, end quote. However, Andrade doesn't say that ineffective training and military exercise drills were a major contributing factor to the Qing army's defeat by the British. On the contrary, he states explicitly that the worst problem was the Qing army's technological inferiority, which resulted in a military which was grossly ill-equipped for combat with a European force. Andrade quotes at length a British report on the Qing dynasty's military strength written in 1836. The report observed that Qing army gunpowder was, in Andrade's words, quote, coarse, uneven, and liable to spoil, end quote. And its cannons were, quote, old-fashioned with uneven bores and primitive carriages, end quote, which were extremely difficult to manoeuvre or aim with any degree of accuracy. The report commented that Qing army firearms were, quote, ill-made, end quote, and highly out of date, to the extent that soldiers still used bows and arrows, which the report said were, quote, the most efficient of their arms, end quote. The report characterised Qing army fortifications as being in an, quote, infant state, end quote, and ridiculed them as being no better than the kind of temporary defences a European army engineer corps would construct in a single night. Andrade says the British author of the report thought the Qing Navy's ships were, quote, laughable, end quote, quoting the report saying they were, quote, beyond the power of description or ridicule to portray, end quote. This primary source material not only provides evidence that the Qing military were significantly technologically inferior to the British, but that the British were fully aware of this fact well before the Opium Wars began, and consequently rightly confident of their victory. As if this was not enough, there is also clear evidence that certain Qing leaders were also well aware that their army was hopelessly technologically inferior to the British. In 1842, Lin Zixu, the Qing dynasty's commissioner for opium, wrote a letter to a friend in which he gave his own perspective on why the Qing had lost the opium wars. In Lin's view, there was absolutely no doubt that the Qing army had been defeated due to its technological inferiority. He observed that even while the British cannons were three miles away, quote, our cannons cannot reach them, but theirs can reach us, end quote, adding, quote, their cannons fired as repeating guns, end quote, and, quote, ours had to wait for some time after we fired one cannonball, end quote. Lin's blunt statements, quote, our weaponry was inferior, end quote, and, quote, our technology was backward, end quote, 
demonstrate indisputably that he regarded the Qing's military technological inferiority to be the primary cause of their loss. Even 20 years later, in 1862, Qing army commander Li Hongqiang lamented, quote, I am deeply shamed by the vast inferiority of China's military equipment as compared to that of foreign countries, end quote, saying that he urged his officers and men, quote, to be open-minded and swallow humiliation in order to learn a few of the Westerners' secrets, which would bring us benefits and enable us to fight them, end quote. So mainstream scholarship, as well as both British and Qing leaders at the time of the Opium Wars, all agree that technological inferiority was the primary reason for the Qing army's defeat. British firearms were superior to Qing firearms. The commenter claimed Qing Dynasty firearms were only about 50 years behind British firearms and that both sides were using smoothbore muskets. They wrote thus, quote, Qing small arms were of the muskets of muzzle-loading smoothbore matchlock variety, so state-of-the-art for about 1650. The British used muzzle-loading smoothbore flintlocks, called firelocks at the time, at the start of the war, so state-of-the-art for 1700. They moved to percussion lock muskets, end quote. There's a lot wrong with this. It's true that the Qing were using muzzle-loading smoothbore matchlock muskets of designs dating to about the 17th century. However, it is not true that the British were using smoothbore flintlock muskets or that they only later moved to percussion lock muskets, and it's absolutely not true that British firearms at this time were state-of-the-art for 1700. Let's look first at what the Qing were using. Mao writes that at the time of the Opium Wars, the Qing firearms, quote, were copies of Western weapons that had been introduced to China during the Ming period, end quote. The Ming dynasty ended in 1644, so the commenter is right to say that Qing firearms were, quote, state of the art for about 1650, end quote, though even this assumes they were copies of European guns dating to the mid-17th century, whereas some of them were actually copies of much earlier models. Mao says that they were, quote, really locally made versions of old foreign guns, end quote, adding that they were, quote, about 200 years behind the British weapons, end quote. However, apart from mere age, we need to examine the technological characteristics of these weapons and the impact this had on their performance. Mao explains that the Qing army had up to 58 different types of muzzle-loading smoothbore firearms, with the most common being two meters long, capable of firing one to two rounds a minute to a range of 100 meters. The commenter claimed that the British used smoothbore flintlock muskets, only later moving to percussion lock smoothbore muskets, and said that the British muskets were state-of-the-art for about 1800. However, this isn't true at all. In fact, Mao comments, quote, the British had some of the most advanced weapons in the world, end quote. Mao explains that the British used the Barker rifle, which was developed around 1800, not 1700, and was a flintlock rifle, not a smoothbore musket. The difference is that the inside of a rifle barrel has grooves cut into it in a slightly twisting pattern, causing the bullet to spin rapidly as it exits the barrel, providing far greater stability in flight, increasing both range and accuracy dramatically. The Qing were using smoothbore muskets, but the British were using rifles. Additionally, the Barker rifle fired two to three rounds a minute to a range of around 200 meters. Mao observes that the British also used the Brunswick rifle from 1838, one year prior to the First Opium War. The Brunswick was a percussion cap rifle firing three to four rounds a minute to a range of around 300 meters. This means that at the start of the Opium War, the British were using rifles, not smoothbore muskets, as the commenter claimed. Additionally, although the commenter claimed British firearms were state-of-the-art for 1700, in fact, they were using some firearms which were state-of-the-art for 1800, and some firearms which were state-of-the-art for the very year that the Opium Wars started. So the Qing firearms were smoothbore muskets, firing one to two rounds a minute, to a range of up to 100 meters, 
while the British firearms were flintlock or percussion cap rifles firing two to four rounds a minute to a range of up to 200 or 300 metres. This means that even the worst of the British firearms had a rate of fire twice as fast as the best Qing firearms with double the effective range. The best of the British firearms had a rate of fire up to four times as fast as the best Qing firearms with three times the effective range. Consequently, Mao writes, quote, the Qing weapons had several disadvantages compared with the British arms, end quote, citing their oversized length, which made them hard to reload, their outdated firing mechanisms, which, quote, functioned poorly, if at all, in bad weather, end quote, their slow rate of fire, and their short range. In Mao's assessment, quote, two Qing soldiers' muskets were no match for one Baker rifle, while one Brunswick rifle could outperform five muskets, end quote. Adding the accuracy advantage of the British firearms, Mao concludes, quote, the British weapons were perhaps several times better still, end quote. So, contrary to the claims of the commenter, the British were using firearms which were totally up to date to the era in which the Opium Wars took place and which were technologically several orders of magnitude ahead of Qing firearms, to the extent that one British firearm could outperform three to five Qing firearms. But the British technological advantage went even further than this. To this point, we've been treating all Qing and British firearms as basically uniform in performance. This is entirely realistic for the British firearms, but certainly not for the Qing firearms. Mao explains that by this time, the British were manufacturing their weapons by machine, using lathes and other technological achievements to improve the standardization and precision of product manufacturing. As a result, British firearms were made to far higher quality standards, resulting in straighter barrels with fewer gaps between projectile and barrel, increasing both range and accuracy. This meant that any British rifle could be expected to perform reliably at the same high standard. However, Mao notes this was absolutely not the case for the Qing firearms, which were still being made by hand and consequently suffered from numerous manufacturing defects, as well as a far lower degree of standardization and overall quality. Mao writes that as a result of Qing manufacturing by hand, quote, gun barrels were thick, uneven, and had rough patches, which disturbed the trajectory of shot, reducing the weapon's accuracy, end quote. Mao also explains that this resulted in firearms with an uneven caliber, the gun's internal diameter. A caliber too narrow prevented enough gunpowder being added to launch the shot effectively, while a caliber too wide resulted in too much gas escaping, lowering the internal pressure and reducing projectile range and power. So not only was even the best Qing firearm significantly technologically inferior to the average British firearm, the average quality of Qing firearms was much lower than the best, and the worst Qing firearms were next to useless. The commenter acknowledged one other weakness of the Qing firearms, writing, quote, The British had bayonets, but the Qing didn't. Those are useful in hand-to-hand -hand combat, end quote. Mao comments on this specifically, explaining that the reason why the Qing firearms didn't have bayonets was that they were just too long. Since, as Mao says, bayonets, quote, were standard on Western weapons at this time, end quote, the Qing firearms, quote, were not only worse in terms of firing rate and range, but were also ineffective in close combat, end quote. This is further evidence that Qing firearms were objectively technologically less advanced and that their inferiority to British firearms was a direct result of that technological gap. The commenter also acknowledged that the Qing army relied on bows and arrows, but attempted to argue that these were superior to the British firearms. They wrote, quote, What's the rate of fire per minute of a muzzle-loading firearm? Three per minute if one is skilled. A skilled archer can fire 20 arrows in the same minute. The Banno men possessed some of the finest composite bows in history, ones with a range of 350 metres and still packing a punch. A flintlock's range was about 100 metres, end quote. Firstly, as we have already seen, the British firearms had a range far beyond 100 metres. The Barker flintlock rifle had a range of 200 metres. The Brunswick percussion cap rifle had a range of 200 metres.
These ranges are two to three times greater than the 100 meters claimed by the commenter. It's true that a skilled Qing army archer could lose arrows far faster than a British rifleman armed even with the Brunswick could fire their shots, but the Qing archers were far less effective than the commenter claims. Andrade notes that although, quote, many Qing soldiers preferred to fight the British with bow and arrow, end quote, this was an unequal contest which, quote, did not usually end well, end quote, for the Qing. In fact, we have primary sourced evidence that the British regarded the Qing archers as completely ineffective. Andrade quotes a British report of a Qing archer losing four arrows at a British officer, but, quote, without effect, end quote. The British report continues, quote, had they been musket balls, however, he could scarcely have escaped, end quote. This not only shows that Qing archers were recognized by the British as an insignificant threat, but also shows that the British were well aware that firearms of the era were far superior. This is made even more clear that the report goes on to describe how a British soldier responded by firing his gun at the Qing archer, with the result that, quote, the aim was unerring and he fell, end quote. So here we have a report of a Qing archer losing four arrows at a British soldier with no effect whatsoever, whereas a British soldier fires a single bullet at the archer and kills them instantly. As the British realized, the speed at which Qing archers could lose their arrows was completely irrelevant since they were so ineffective, and not even a close match for a bullet from a rifled musket. British cannon was superior to Qing cannon. The commenter claimed, quote, the Qing certainly possessed cannon of late 18th century and early 19th standard, end quote. In support of this, they quoted Duncan McPherson, a British physician who documented the First Opium War as an eyewitness, who wrote that the Chinese had built, quote, extensive and powerful batteries, end quote, and who also commented, quote, their guns are in many instances equal to any of European manufacture, end quote. This sounds very convincing, and we should certainly credit McPherson's account with some degree of accuracy, given the fact that he personally observed the weapons of the Chinese military. However, we should also remember that although McPherson was an army man, he was a physician rather than a soldier, so his assessment of military equipment which he himself did not use, and which he may not have been able to examine with the benefit of any relevant technical knowledge, may be incomplete at best, and misleading at worst. In this case, we have very clear evidence from a range of sources that McPherson's complementary description of the Qing army's cannon is unintentionally misleading. The Qing artillery was far less impressive than McPherson's description suggests, and was distinctly inferior to the British artillery in a number of important ways. One useful source of information about Qing artillery is the eyewitness accounts we have from British soldiers themselves who had far more artillery knowledge and experience. Lieutenant Charles Cameron was an officer in the British Expeditionary Force which fought the First Opium War, and his personal diary is enlightening. On the 5th of July 1840, he wrote of a military engagement with the Qing army which he notes the British won easily due to the overwhelming superiority of their ship's cannons, which bombarded the Qing soldiers on the land and suppressed all resistance. After coming ashore, Cameron took some time to look at the Qing cannons, which he describes very dismissively, writing, quote, On examination, we found their guns of the most paltry description and eaten up by rust, end quote. This is particularly important because he identifies two different reasons why the Qing cannons are bad. Firstly, he says they are paltry, meaning they are insignificant or weak. Secondly, he says they are eaten up by rust, meaning they are in a very poor condition. This does not give the impression of the Qing owning guns which were equal to any of European manufacture. He does single one particular cannon out for praise, and it's very important to see what he says about it. He says it's a, quote, brass 32, end quote which was, quote, in splendid order, and bore the inscription, John Phillips made this piece, A.D. 1601, end quote. The fact that this cannon was made from brass explains why it had not suffered from rust, since brass quickly forms a patina, 
or outward layer of oxidized metal called verdigris, which protects it from further degradation by rust. Describing it as a 32 means it fired a 32 pound shot, one of the standard sizes for cannons in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Finally, the fact that it was inscribed with the words, quote, John Phillips made this piece AD 1601, end quote, shows not only that it was a cannon of Western manufacture, but that it was around 230 years old by the time of the Opium Wars. From this brief account, we gain a significant amount of information about Lieutenant Cameron's estimation of the Qing Army's cannons. He gives the impression that most of their cannon were insignificant, weak, and in poor condition, and the only good cannon they had were made by Western manufacturers, and even these were very old. This is very different from the impression Macpherson gives. We also have various eyewitness accounts by John Elliot Bingham, a British naval officer who took part in the Opium Wars. His reports are particularly important because he was often present at the capture of Qing army artillery and provides detailed information on their construction quality. Bingham's accounts are particularly important because they provide first-hand evidence supporting these conclusions reached by mainstream modern scholarship on the quality of Qing artillery. 1. The Qing army had a range of cannon of widely varying quality, from very poor to very good. 2. Qing artillery quality was inconsistent and typically poor due to lack of technological knowledge and skill. 3. Qing cannon often lacked proper aiming equipment due partly to the Qing's ignorance of the physics and mathematics of ballistics and partly to technological limitations. 4. The Qing leadership were well aware that most of their guns were inferior to British artillery and were trying to improve them but had great difficulty doing so. The very fact that Bingham's accounts of Qing artillery are varied, praising cannons of good quality, and pouring scorn on those he regarded as inferior, is strong evidence that his descriptions are generally reliable. He actually provides more positive reports of Qing cannon construction than negative. Bingham describes a number of guns he came across on one occasion as, quote, very long Chinese 12 and 24 pounders, with the exception of two carronades, evidently old English ship guns, end quote. He doesn't comment specifically on the quality of the guns themselves, but he does mention their carriages, which he said, quote, were of the most ordinary description, only a few of them having trucks, the others being merely beds of wood on which the guns rested, end quote. This means most of them were just blocks of wood, and that only a few of them could be positioned for firing while on their carriages. On another occasion, Bingham also took note of the poor quality of the Qing gun carriages, writing, quote, The carriages of the guns were of the most inferior description, with the exception of four, which were mounted on traversing carriages, similar to those on board the steamers. End quote. Again, we find most of the Qing cannon mounted on very basic carriages, preventing them being aimed with accuracy. However, Bingham was much more enthusiastic about other Qing guns he found. In one case, he says he found 36 guns which were, quote, new, of brass, and well cast, end quote. And in another, he writes, quote, the brass guns found in this city were very well cast, of great thickness of metal, and smoothly bored, end quote. Adding, quote, some of the gun carriages were superior to anything of the kind which had yet been seen in China, end quote. Examining these better cannons, Bingham noted they were copies of foreign cannons, noting, quote, the Chinese, in the material of war, are conquering their antipathy to copy anything from other nations, end quote. Bingham's observation that the Qing were copying foreign cannons indicates that the Qing leadership themselves were fully aware of the inferiority of their artillery technology and were attempting to get up to date as fast as they could. This is confirmed by a Qing government order quoted by Bingham, which not only commanded the construction of new cannon to replace those which had been lost, but also said, quote, Moreover, the guns must be cast on an improved principle to meet the change of the times. End quote. Clearly, the Qing leadership recognized the need to improve their metal casting technology 
in order to produce artillery which could match the British cannon. However, Bingham also reports that Qing efforts to upgrade the quality of their cannons were only partially successful. He describes an occasion on which the Qing arms manufacturers attempted to build new cannon large enough to sink the dangerous British ships, observing, quote, In this they were nearly as unsuccessful as they had been with their shipbuilding, end quote, explaining that the first gun which was tested immediately exploded, quote, killing a corporal and two privates, end quote, and that subsequently it was difficult to find any men willing to test any of the other cannon which had been made. It's also worth noting Bingham's comments on the Qing army firearms he found, which he ridiculed, writing, quote, the guns were of the most miserable description, end quote, adding, quote, several were mere bars of iron hooped together, end quote. I would be more inclined to trust Cameron and Bingham as actual soldiers than Macpherson, an army physician, on the topic of the quality of Qing army artillery, especially given that Cameron and Bingham's descriptions are significantly more detailed, with Bingham even providing details on the smoothness of the cannons in a barrel, and given that both Cameron and Bingham would have had personal experience with cannon. However, we aren't reduced to simply guessing which of these accounts is more accurate. We have a great deal of historical information on the Qing Dynasty's artillery technology, allowing us to compare Qing cannon with their British equivalents. When we do, we find that the Qing artillery was significantly inferior. Mao writes, quote, The Qing and British cannon were still broadly similar in design and technology during the Opium War, end quote, which seems to suggest that both armies had artillery of equivalent quality. However, he adds, quote, The differences between the two stemmed from differences in the quality of the workmanship, end quote. From this point, the vast technological difference between the British and Qing artillery starts to become very clear. Mao says Qing cannon used poor quality iron, resulting from less advanced smelting technology, causing air bubbles to form in the iron barrel, which weakened it. Mao notes, quote, cannon made of this material were prone to misfiring or blowing up and injuring the artillerymen, end quote. In contrast, Mao explains that technological advancements produced by the Industrial Revolution ensured the British had, quote, high quality material for the casting of artillery pieces, end quote. To compensate, Qing cannon makers occasionally increased the thickness of cannon bodies, making them very heavy and difficult to move. However, Mao observes, quote, a large Qing cannon weighing several thousand kilograms was not equal in firepower to a much lighter Western cannon. End quote. Another improved method of construction was the use of a copper alloy, but cannon of this type could not be made in significant numbers by the Qing due to lack of access to copper. Commenting on the weakness of Qing artillery, Mao cites an occasion on which six newly constructed cannon exploded after firing just one round. This is exactly the same kind of incident Bingham reported. On another occasion, out of a batch of 59 newly constructed cannon, 10 exploded when test fired, and three others were damaged by misfires, with the result that, according to Mao, quote, fewer than three quarters could be used, end quote. Clearly, Qing metal founding techniques were highly unreliable. Mao further notes, quote, Qing casting technology was also less advanced than that of the British, end quote, explaining that the British were already producing cannon with metal moulds and lathes, making their barrels smooth and even, whereas the Qing were still using clay moulds, resulting in barrels with rough interiors, which reduced accuracy. Mao also explains that by this time, quote, in Britain, scientists and manufacturers had experimented with almost every aspect of cannon design and use, end quote, whereas in contrast, quote, Qing gunsmiths basically just replicated earlier cannon without paying attention to the barrel-to-calibre ratio, or the significance of the touch hole position for the powder ignition. End quote. Consequently, Mao says the Qing cannon were less effective than the British. Mao also comments on Qing artillery carriages and sighting mechanisms, which he says were quote, incomplete and ineffective. End quote. Adding quote, many cannon did not even have a carriage and were fixed in place. End quote. 
However, he explains, quote, the Qing military never paid much attention to this, end quote, describing many Qing cannon as having no sighting devices at all, with the result that artillerymen had no way to determine the trajectory of their shots and had to rely on estimation. Additionally, according to Mao, although British artillery had a range of projectiles available, such as solid shot, multiple round shot, and explosive shot, quote, the Qing used only the least effective kind of solid shot, which was often crudely manufactured or of too small a caliber, end quote. However, it should be noted that on at least one occasion, Bingham discovered Qing cannon accompanied by chain shot, a more advanced kind of projectile invented in the 17th century and still used in the 19th century, especially against ship sails and rigging. In this particular case, Bingham observed, quote, their chain shot were particularly good, end quote. Nevertheless, this does seem to have been an exception to the norm. Mao also explains, quote, the Qing military lacked a system for the regular repair and replacement of its cannon, just as it had none for muskets, end quote, with the result that many Qing cannon were in very bad condition, suffering from rust and other forms of damage. Mao summarizes the difference between the Qing and British artillery by writing, quote, In sum, even though the basic models of the cannon used by the Qing and British forces were similar, differences in the quality of the manufacturing meant that the Qing cannon had a more limited range, a slower firing rate, less power, were less maneuverable, and less accurate. Deficiencies that severely limited their effectiveness against the British, end quote. As we have seen, Mao attributes these deficiencies of the Qing artillery directly to technological inferiority. Andrade describes how European developments in ballistic science gave them a significant advantage over the Qing army, writing of the British carronades, which were, quote, able to hurl massive amounts of iron at close range in rapid succession and with relatively little powder, end quote and proved to be, quote, a key armament of the war, end quote. Andrade explains, quote, the new ballistic science also underlaid the development of new field guns, end quote, which he says, quote, played key roles in the Opium War, end quote. In addition to European advances in ballistics, Andrade writes, quote, a multitude of formal and informal experiments played a role, as did new methods of casting and boring. End quote. However, he notes that European ballistics science in particular was transformative on the battlefield, since, quote, the Chinese had no equivalent knowledge, end quote. Consequently, Andrade says, quote, they were unprepared for the overwhelming advantage the British had in terms of firepower, end quote. British gunpowder was superior to Qing gunpowder. As we have seen, Qing firearms and cannon were significantly inferior to their European counterparts as a result of advances in European metalworking technology and ballistics science. However, the poor quality of Qing gunpowder also reduced the efficacy of their weapons. Mao notes that by the 19th century, European advances in chemistry and physics had determined the ideal proportions of the three ingredients of gunpowder. Subsequently, European armies used a combination of these ingredients which was within 0.5 to 1% of the ideal, providing a highly efficient and very powerful gunpowder. Additionally, industrialization and mechanization enabled good quality gunpowder to be made in high volume, with the result that, as Andrade writes, quote, British gunpowder came from cutting-edge factories, end quote. Mao explains the very high quality of British gunpowder was the product of, quote, the developing sciences of physics and chemistry, as well as industrial tools, end quote, such as mechanized machinery, which produced the gunpowder through a lengthy sequence of steps, ensuring it was smooth, dry, dense, and highly resistant to absorbing moisture. Mao writes, quote, these industrial processes were responsible for the excellent quality of British gunpowder. End quote. In contrast, Mao describes the Qing era gunpowder as being made by hand, quote, according to the same recipe used in the late Ming military. End quote. 
Qing gunpowder manufacturers had only a pre-modern understanding of the chemistry involved, with the result that their gunpowder used an ineffective and wasteful mix of ingredients, reducing the gunpowder's power and increasing its susceptibility to water absorption. Although the scientific revolution, chemical revolution and industrial revolution had all taken place in Europe by this time, none of them had taken place in the East. Consequently, Mao notes, quote, Qing gunpowder manufacturers lacked the scientific and technological knowledge necessary to refine their gunpowder with mechanized processes which improved the quality and maintained a high degree of standardization. End quote. According to Mao, Qing gunpowder was quote, rough and of uneven size, end quote, and frequently quote, did not fully ignite. End quote. Mao adds, quote, this low quality had a direct impact on the power of firearms and cannon, further diminishing their effectiveness. End quote. British soldiers commented explicitly on the low quality of Qing gunpowder, which they considered to be so poor as to be basically worthless. Lieutenant John Bingham, quoted previously, wrote, quote, Though the proportions in Chinese powder are very nearly ours, it is a most inferior article, end quote and described how a large quantity of captured Qing gunpowder was, quote, thrown into the sea, end quote, by the British soldiers, who considered it useless. Occasionally, the British did use Qing gunpowder to blow up weapons or ships captured from the enemy, rather than use their own higher quality powder. Another British advantage was their use of rocketry. By the time of the Opium War, the Congreve rocket, named after its British inventor, and based originally on rockets produced in the Kingdom of Mysore in India, was a standard weapon in British armies. Andrade says the Congreve rocket, quote, played a devastating role in the Opium War, end quote. The Qing army also used rockets, which were the product of several centuries of experimentation. However, those centuries of experimentation were still based on medieval science. Since Qing rockets were made without a modern understanding of chemistry or ballistics, they were extremely ineffective. The British officer John Bingham, quoted previously, called Qing rockets, quote, the most childish weapon that can be imagined, end quote, adding, quote, they generally discharged them in showers of thousands at a time, which were admired for their beauty, but never dreaded by us from any injury they were likely to do, end quote. Qing Superstition and Magical Thinking Finally, it must be noted that the Qing army leadership also relied on superstition and magical beliefs, to an extent which indicated the very insignificant place science held in Qing leadership thinking. Historian Julia Lovell relates that Lin Zixu, the scholar official in charge of the Qing army during the First Opium War, believed priests of the philosophical religion Taoism would help him defeat the British navy. Taoist priests were believed to have magical powers, which would surely be a significant contribution to any war effort. Lovell says, quote, Lin had planned to use masters of Taoist breathing techniques who claimed to be able to walk on riverbeds for up to 10 hours at a time to dive down and drill holes in British ships, end quote. The fact that Lin actually believed this indicates just how distant he was from scientific thinking. However, Lovell notes that when put to the test, the Taoist masters were found to be frauds who were, quote, good only for bobbing about in the shallows, end quote. This would have been absolutely no surprise to anyone with a scientific mind. Similarly, Mao cites the case of Prince Yi Jing, nephew of the emperor, preparing an attack on British forces, writing, quote, Yi Jing's method of deciding the timing of the attack was even more absurd, end quote. Mao explains that Yi Jing determined the best time to attack by visiting a temple dedicated to Guan Di, a god in folk religion and Taoism, to have his fortune told. As Mao observes, quote, the outcome of a battle plan decided by superstition is readily imaginable, end quote. Sinologist Arthur Daly writes of another incident on which a Qing general chose to attack on a specific date on the basis of, quote, traditional Chinese war magic, end quote. This is not scientific thinking. 
it must be recognized that there would have been plenty of religion and superstition on the British side. Sailors, in particular, were well known for their superstitions and magical thinking. Likewise, there would also have been plenty of religious belief among the British leadership, and there's no doubt that British soldiers and officers would have engaged in prayers and other religious rituals in order to seek protection and good fortune in battle. However, such actions on the British side were at the individual level and didn't affect or influence overall battle operations. A British sailor might rub a lucky charm or perform some other small superstitious ritual before carrying out their duties, but the captain wouldn't imagine they could attack enemy ships by summoning mermaids or using magic spells to call up a storm. Likewise, British gunners might cross their fingers for luck before firing their cannonballs, but when preparing their shots, they would rely on the high quality of their gunpowder, the accuracy of their sighting and aiming devices, and the timing of their fuses, rather than holding a seance and seeking guidance from spirits. British officers would very likely pray before a battle, but would not plan their troop movements by reading random Bible verses and trusting that God was communicating specific strategic instruction to them through the text. British army leaders didn't try to win battles through magic and religion, whereas a number of the key Qing army leaders definitely did. Conclusion There is a scholarly consensus that the vast technological gap between the British and the Qing was the most significant factor in the Qing army's defeat in the Opium Wars. Historian of economics Joel Moker writes, quote, An oft-cited example of the gap between Western and Chinese technology is the Opium War between Britain and China in 1842, when superior technology allowed Britain to impose scandalous terms on a huge and proud empire. End quote. Likewise, historian Sujit Sivasundaram says, quote, This technological gap included firearms, cannon and powder, the theory of ballistics, and the organization of drill. End quote. Historian Ariane Knusel writes, quote, The Opium Wars demonstrated the massive technological gap between China and the Western powers. End quote. Historian Chen Yalan observes the technology gap was well understood by the Qing government itself, writing, quote, Only after defeat in the Opium War did the Qing rulers see the consequences of the poor quality of military weapons. End quote. As we have seen, there is also plenty of evidence for this in British accounts of the Opium Wars. Andrade writes, quote, When British observers noted how bad Chinese guns were, or how poor at aiming the Chinese artillerists were, they were drawing a clear and objective contrast. End quote. The Opium Wars were ultimately won through a superior knowledge of science and technology. Qing gunpowder manufacturers did not understand the chemistry of the compounds they were mixing and consequently could not mix them efficiently. Nor did they understand the chemistry and physics of explosives, so they did not know how to granulate and polish gunpowder so it would burn at the different rates required by different weapons, such as muskets and cannons. Qing artillery manufacturers lacked the understanding of mathematics and physics necessary to develop a science of ballistics, so their sighting and aiming equipment was very basic and highly inaccurate. Andrade observes, quote, In the mid-18th century, while Europeans were experimenting with the ballistic pendulum, the Chinese were making no significant investigations into ballistics, and this gave the British an overwhelming advantage, end quote. Adding, quote, Qing gun carriages usually didn't even allow for easy rotation or changing elevation whereas British guns had all manner of aiming devices, end quote. Andrade further explains that ballistics science wasn't only essential for aiming artillery, but was critical to the accurate use of explosive shot, which required specific timing. He notes that although the Chinese had used explosive shot for centuries, they lacked the mathematical and ballistic knowledge necessary to design fuses which would burn at the correct speeds so the explosive shells would detonate at the correct time. Some kinds of artillery required shells to explode before reaching the ground, just above the heads of the enemy, while others required shells to explode just after landing. Andrade says, quote, European artillery officers were able to time the explosion of shells with unprecedented precision 
end quote, adding, quote, explosive shells were one of the technologies most marveled at by Chinese, end quote. British weapons were centuries ahead of Qing weapons precisely because British science and technology were centuries ahead of Qing knowledge. The Qing had not yet experienced the scientific revolution, the chemical revolution, or the industrial revolution. Andrade puts it simply, quote, British gunnery was based on experimental science. Chinese gunnery wasn't, end quote.